Hey everybody, Marcus here. In the last video, we covered the feminist epistemological model called standpoint theory. In that model, we found how feminists construct an oppressor and oppressed dichotomy based on the model that was produced by Karl Marx. We also learned about the idea of epistemic privilege and how it is the oppressed that possesses. From these assertions, we learned why feminists attempt to impose a listen and believe mantra onto men as the supposed oppressors. Standpoint theory also provided the basis on which we can see the formulation, well, of the progressive stack. Now, in this video, we will be talking about postmodernism feminism as the second of three epistemological models developed in feminist epistemology. The postmodernist model is, well, very different from standpoint theory, but is still built on the foundation of the situated knower. Now, this video is going to show us uh, how intersectional feminism has emerged. It will also show us how the additional divisions of race, sexual orientation, you know, and so on are introduced into the progressive stack. In addition to this, it is going to show us how the social construction of gender came about. But most importantly, this video will cover how inevitably feminism, thanks to postmodernism, will destroy itself. Now, before we can adequately dive into postmodernist feminism, uh, we should lay down a little bit of groundwork on postmodernism itself. Though I have briefly touched on postmodernism in my Blame the French video as part of my series on feminism, here I will give a more comprehensive insight into the philosophical assertions of postmodernism. The first thing we need to note is that postmodernism was developed almost exclusively well by French thinkers. One of the key figures we discussed was Derrida and his idea of deconstruction. As my first task, I hope to show you how postmodernism came about, secondly, how it leads up to deconstruction, and finally, how feminism has appropriated postmodernism and the method of deconstruction. Okay, let's get started. The Enlightenment philosopher Immanuel Kant wrote a treatise entitled The Critique of Pure Reason in 1781. Now, Kant in general was a massively influential philosopher, but the critique of pure reason is of particular interest to us. Though I will not attempt to recreate his arguments here, I will explain to you the conclusions he came, um, you know, where relevant. Before Kant, it was traditionally held that reason was analytic, meaning that what is stated in the predicate must already be present in the subject. You know, so for example, an intelligent man is intelligent or an intelligent man is a man. In either case, the judgment is analytic because it is ascertained by analyzing the subject. It was thought that all truths of reason or necessary truths are of this kind, that in all of them there is a predicate that is only part of the subject of which it is asserted. If this were so, attempting to deny anything uh, that could be known a priori, you know, for example, an intelligent man is not intelligent, or an intelligent man is not a man, would involve a contradiction. It was therefore thought that the law of non-contradiction is sufficient to establish all a, a priori knowledge. For, you know, a much more robust discussion of a priori versus a posteriori and analytic versus synthetic subject predicate judgments, please watch my video entitled MGTOW Counts Semantics. Now, the philosopher David Hume at first accepted the general view of rationalism about a priori knowledge. However, upon closer examination of the subject, Hume discovered that some judgments thought to be analytic, especially those related to cause and effect, were actually synthetic, meaning no analysis of the subject will reveal the predicate. They thus depend exclusively upon experience and are therefore a posteriori. Before Hume, rationalists had held that effect could be deduced from cause. Hume argued that it could not, and from this inferred that nothing at all could be known a priori in relation to cause and effect. Kant, who was brought up under the auspices of rationalism, was deeply disturbed by Hume's skepticism. Anyways, Kant set out on a project to see how to defeat this form of skepticism. Through his inquiry, Kant came to demonstrate, well, a number of things. I will only call out those that are important to this video. Firstly, Kant made a distinction between the noumenal world and the phenomenal world. The difference between the two is well, actually pretty simple. The noumenal world is the world as it is in itself and is independent of the human observer. The phenomenal world, in turn, is what the human being perceives the noumenal world as. 
Kant concluded that space and time are not part of the noumenal world, but are in fact built into human perception. The ultimate conclusion Kant reached was that in fact a human being can never access the noumenal world and therefore can never see the world as it is in itself. A human being is therefore restricted to a human perspective. This means that man knows nothing and cannot know anything of the noumenal world even though the noumenal world is ultimately the origin of all sense perception. From this, he developed the transcendental idealism. Kant held that everything a human being understands of the world is really just a product of the mind based on some hardwired demands of the human experience, such as sensing space and time. Now, let us take a simple example um, to understanding all the moving parts. Imagine there's something in the noumenal world as a, as a rock. So we have this noumenal rock we know nothing of and can, uh, and can know nothing about. Now, whatever impressions that our noumenal rock has upon our perceptions, it produces in us a phenomenal rock, a rock as we see in space and time, that, you know, has a certain shape, weight, hardness, and so on. Finally, we have the word rock. In this way, the word rock is a sign for a phenomenal idea of rock, which is something our human perspective forces on us based on the noumenal rock, which we can truly know nothing about. Because all humans have built into their very mode of perceiving the qualities of space and time, this noumenal rock will always look like a rock in space and time to all people, but space and time are not themselves qualities of the noumenal rock. Okay, the question now becomes, how does this lead up to postmodernism? Well, the postmodernist makes the claim that since nothing can be known about the noumenal world and the phenomenal perception of every individual is not in self accessible to anyone but the person experiencing the perception, then the intelligible world is discursively constructed. This means that the only reality we can speak of is the reality we construct in language. Postmodernism embodies a skeptical sensibility that questions all attempts to transcend our situatedness by appeal to such ideas as universality, necessity, objectivity, rationality, essence, unity, totality, foundations, and ultimate truths and ultimate reality. It stresses the locality, partiality, contingency, instability, uncertainty, ambiguity, and essential contestability of any particular account of the world, the self, and the good. Postmodernists also assert that the linguistic sign acts reflexively, not referentially, in a discursive field. Now, this is a version of radical meaning holism. Signs get their meaning not from their reference to external things, but from their relation to all the other signs in a system of discourse. Meaning holism entails that the introduction of new signs or the elimination of old ones will change the meanings of the signs that were already in use. Signs, therefore, do not have a fixed meaning over time. Together, these ideas support the rejection of totalizing met meta-narratives. There can be no complete, unified theory of the world that captures the whole truth about it. Any such theory will contain a definite set of terms. This entails that it cannot express all conceptual possibilities. For a discourse that contained different terms would contain meaning not available in the discursive field of the theory that claims completeness. Thus, the selection of any particular theory or narrative is an exercise of power to exclude certain possibilities from thought and to authorize others. What this basically boils down to is that any two worldviews cannot be compared to anything objective, you know, to see which one is correct. If you cannot deem one correct over the other, then a choice of one over the other is nothing more than an enactment of power. Now, you might be asking yourself how such a claim can be made in virtue of, say, science. Well, it's actually pretty simple to resolve. You see, science prides itself on its pr uh, predictive power and the usefulness of its products. However, to assign weight or importance to predictive power or usefulness in general is an act of power. Therefore, to favor science over, say, reading tea leaves is not an objective decision, but a subjective decision based on one's own values. But postmodernists do not stop at language, no. Postmodernism extends these ideas about language to social practices more generally. The key idea underwriting this extension is that actions and practices are linguistic signs. 
One example being, well, body language. Like words, they signify things beyond themselves by means of linguistic devices such as metaphor and metonymy. For example, the elevation of the judge's bench metaphorically signifies his superior authority over everyone else in the courtroom. This permits an analysis of social practices and behaviors as exhibiting the same structure and dynamic well as language itself. Just as words get their meaning from their relations to other words rather than from their relation to some external reality, so do actions get their meaning from their relations to other actions. Rather than from you know, their relations to some pre-linguistic realm of human nature or natural law. So, what we end up with is that reality in postmodernism is a function of language and actions. Any preference for one interpretation over another then becomes an act of power and not a decision based on some objective criteria used to come, well, to the decision. Now, let us close off this tour of postmodernism with Derrida and his method of deconstruction. What deconstruction tends to do is collapse the meaning of words into an ever-growing set of words. So, the meaning is deferred to other words, and those words in turn defer to yet more words. This whole process, in theory, could end if a language was closed, but as new words are being introduced and old words are being removed, in practice, this process can go on forever. The simplest example of a person playing the deconstruction game, well, is someone who keeps saying, well, yes, but that depends on what you mean by X. If you are speaking to someone who seems to be playing out the conversation, you know, in a way where you find yourself spending most of the time defining words, then, well, you are playing the deconstruction game. Okay, so based on what we have said so far, we can clearly see how the idea that everything is socially constructed comes into play. If language can only come into being as a social activity, and language is what our reality is predicated on, then everything we speak of is in a way socially constructed. Now, clearly, the noumenal rock is not socially constructed, but, but anything and everything said about it is. So, even though you can still fall off a noumenal cliff and die, the notions of cliff, fall, and die are socially constructed concepts, even though they have consequences in the noumenal world. So, now we have identified where the notion of the social construction of gender comes from. But how does postmodernism play itself out well in feminism? Well, within feminism, postmodernist ideas have been deployed against theories that purport to justify sexist practices. Notably, ideologies that claim that observed differences between men and women are natural and necessary, or that women have an essence that explains and justifies their subordination. The off-sided claim that gender is socially or discursively constructed, um, that it is an effect of social practices and systems of meaning that can be disrupted, you know, finds one of its homes in postmodernism. However, postmodernism has figured more prominently in internal critiques of feminist theories. One of the most important trends in feminist thinking uh, in the past 20 years has been exposing and responding to exclusionary tendencies within feminism itself. Women of color and lesbian women have argued that mainstream feminist theories have ignored their distinct problems and perspectives. Feminist postmodernism represents both a vehicle for and response to this critique. It underwrites a critique of the concept woman, you know, the central analytical category of feminist theory, and it proposes perspective shifting as a strategy for negotiating the proliferation of theories produced by different situated women. You see, the postmodernist feminist is altogether a different creature from the standpoint theory feminist. The standpoint theory feminist, you know, as crazy as she is, is fighting a war with conventional weapons. The standpoint theory feminist is trying to get laws changed, you know, and reform existing institutions, but she still acknowledges hard concepts, you know, like woman, man, and so on, you know, as having some concrete grounding. The standpoint feminist is still, well, somewhat rational. The postmodernist feminist, on the other hand, is nuking us from orbit. Her policy is a scorched earth policy, and you know she has no problem taking out the standpoint feminist with, with everybody else. In my second video on feminism, I talk about the feminist prophets. I spoke of the effect of resentment brewing in the woman who cannot themselves join the master caste and therefore manifest master morality. 
Well, the reason the feminist prophet cannot get into the master caste is because concepts like merit, beauty, intelligence, objectivity, and other master values are standing in her way. The feminist prophets are postmodernist feminists, and they have armed themselves with tools to rewrite reality itself. Think about the thesis that all of reality is linguistically constructed, and that to choose one set of beliefs over another is to exercise power. Well, if the current reality does not allow a feminist prophet to be a master, then reality itself must be rewritten. In essence, uh, this is the postmodernist project. The postmodernist feminist project is to collapse concepts like woman, beauty, objectivity, logic, and every other master value that so far helped form the hierarchies of men in relationship to men and women in relationship to women. The collapsing of these concepts will undermine the foundations of these hierarchies and with this deflation of old values, new values could be put into place. Values that will put these feminist prophets on top of the new hierarchies. Now, let us explore one idea in postmodernism that, well, to my knowledge, has never appeared in MGTOW discourse. There is a concept in postmodernism pioneered by Derrida which is called uh, phallogocentrism. Now, this is not itself a feminist invention, but has been adopted by postmodernist feminists in their project of creating the conceptual framework for the patriarchy. Phallogocentrism asserts that the various words in circulation and the meanings they construct have an inherent masculine quality to them. Let me try to help make sense of this. Now, imagine that half the world's population was colorblind, while the other half can see color. Now, imagine that the language that both groups used had a lot of color symbolism built into it. If the colorblind were forced to use such a language, then they would be inherently at a disadvantage, as the phenomenal experience of those who could see color would give them an edge, and that edge would be built into the language, therefore handicapping the colorblind at the level of language. Well, the phallogocentric argument is premised on the claim that modern Western culture has been, and continues to be, both culturally and intellectually subjugated by logocentrism and phallocentrism. Logocentrism is a term Derrida uses to refer to the philosophy of determinateness, while phallocentrism is the term he uses to describe the way logocentrism itself has been genderized by a masculine and patriarchal agenda. Hence, Derrida intentionally merges the two terms phallocentrism and logocentrism as phallogocentrism. Phallogocentrism is viewed as the dominant model and therefore directly contributes to oppression and must be eliminated. Now, let us assume that what postmodernist feminists say is true and that the patriarchy is real and that it oppresses minorities and women and also that it is true that postmodernist feminists want to smash the patriarchy, you know, to remove these oppressions. Well, in order to do so, postmodernist feminists will also need to destroy objectivity, science, and logic itself. In fact, the project to eliminate oppression is an enactment of power that puts more weight on the value of the absence of oppression over the weight of the value of science and logic. This follows from the postmodern view of the world. After all, if reality is discursively constructed, then to pick one version of reality over another is done arbitrarily, you know, as a preference, through the exertion of power. This means that postmodernists would gladly sacrifice science, logic, and reason in exchange for an absence of oppression on the basis of their preference. This is what I mean when I say they are nuking us from orbit. There is going to be a lot of collateral damage in the postmodernist project. Now, I have been promising to show an account of how postmodernism will eventually lead to the death of feminism, and more specifically, how intersectional feminism will forge this path. Well, in the postmodernist view, reality is a function of language. So, ideas such as race, sexual orientation, gender, women, man, and all these others are linguistically or socially constructed. Now, earlier we said that standpoint theory was the beginning of the progressive stack. However, we also said that standpoint theory only carved the world into two chunks. Well, postmodernism gives us new tools with which we can carve up the world. Namely, not only can we carve up the world on sex, but then on each of those two segments, we can carve up on race. And all those new segments can then be carved up on sexual orientation. 
And as we continue to introduce new entries into the list of how we can carve up the world, we start to create progressively more specific and detailed categories. So, a straight white male is a category carved out of three qualities, sexual orientation, race, and gender. But in this way, we also have straight black male, straight Asian male, gay white male, gay black male, you know, and on and on. Now, this can in turn create a progressive stack of oppression in which the straight white male has it better than the straight black male, you know, and so on. But I think the idea of the progressive stack is an incorrect analogy for what we are seeing. You see, in intersectional feminism, two people can in theory be oppressive to each other. So, a gay white male will be oppressive to a straight black male based on race. And in turn, that straight black male will be oppressive to the gay white male based on sexual orientation. This circularity of oppression collapses the clean-cut stack and flow of oppression we saw in standpoint theory. In standpoint theory, it was, well, quite simple. Oppression flowed from men onto women. In intersectional feminism, oppression seems to flow from virtually everybody to virtually everybody else, except, of course, the straight white male who is oppressed by no one. No, I think that the metaphor of a progressive stack is inappropriate. I think that what we are actually seeing is a progressive web. Each connecting line is a flow of oppression from one group to another, with the center node being straight white men who are oppressed by nothing. Now, the development of intersectional feminism should actually be viewed as a positive improvement over the standpoint theory progressive stack, you know, for a number of reasons. Firstly, the progressive web creates a very large number of groups. This means that it creates a large number of small interest groups as opposed to the old paradigm that only has two large interest groups. The second reason why this is positive is because the progressive web distributes the blame of oppression across a large spectrum of people. Thirdly, it makes women oppressors as well. You see, now that you can create a circular relationship of oppression based on race, then a white woman becomes an oppressor to a black man. So, thanks to postmodernism's contribution to intersectional feminism, not only can women become oppressors, but women can oppress men as well. In my opinion, this is a positive development over the standpoint theory model, uh, models one directional oppression you know, from men to women. What the progressive web also means is that certain slices of women can turn on other women with condemnations of oppression. In fact, we already see this. Because of the redistribution of oppression, all white women now become the oppressors of all black women, and, well, to all black men as well. So when you see feminists attacking feminist matriarchs like Germaine Greer or other older pillars of the feminist movement, it stems from this redistribution of oppression, from intersectional feminism. Milo Yiannopoulos made the prediction that the next big development in feminism will be, well, minority wars. Now, this is a true prediction that naturally follows from what I've so far presented about postmodernist feminists. But where Milo stops, I will infer all the way to the logical end of intersectional feminism. From how intersectional feminism is logically arranged, it will, over a long period of time, continue to introduce new criteria on which to carve up people and distribute oppression. This, uh, is in turn, will continue to fragment feminists into ever smaller camps until eventually feminism will be nothing but gang warfare. Now, feminism will only truly die once the feminist prophets are themselves deemed as oppressors. As virtually all feminist prophets are upper middle class white women, that intersectional feminism needs to divide uh, the world on gender, race, class, and education to negatively affect these women. Current intersectional feminism already carves people up on gender and race. Once it introduces class and education level, then upper middle class white female feminist academics will be an oppressor class of its own. Though I have no clear idea how uh, academic pursuit will become a target of division in intersectional feminism, I can speculate that the ever-rising cost of university and the crushing school debt will begin to exclude more and more people who do not come from an upper middle class upbringing, and this will in turn paint an image of elitism as fewer people can afford to enter these institutions. Now, as a lot of women graduate with degrees coming out of the humanities, we will have progressively more women with crushing university debt who have been indoctrinated into feminist thought. 
as these women are basically unskilled labor as far as society is concerned, they will descend down into the working class. With a head full of ideology and a job as a hotel cleaner and crushing debt, I can see resentment brewing in this contingent of women who will begin to identify as part of the working class and feel exploited by the academy. I think it will be a woman, kind of like Anita Sarkeesian, a woman who decides to play a professional victim and starts to accuse universities as oppressive patriarchal constructs designed to chain women with crushing debt that will raise this sort of consciousness within the feminist discourse. But again, this is merely speculation. Ultimately, the gang warfare among the ever-growing number of niche interest groups created by intersectional feminism will destroy feminism one way or another. You know, if not through destroying trust in academic feminists, then through a lack of consensus due to infighting. Now, though this I believe to be the pragmatic outcome of intersectional feminism, I still want to cover the logical outcome of intersectional feminism. You see, as you continue to introduce new criteria on which you carve a people, the member count of any given segment becomes smaller. Eventually, what ends up happening is that the number of groups is equivalent to the number of people, meaning that the logical conclusion of intersectional feminism is, what is once again solipsism. Now, this is no surprise as critical theory is a large player in postmodernism, and as we have said in the previous video, critical theory is by, for, and of the subject of study. If what I have said holds true, then MGTOW in fact is the second best solution to ending feminism. Doing nothing at all to interfere with feminists is taking the advice of Sung Tzu that you should never get in the way of an enemy making a mistake. The best solution is to actively raise consciousness of the oppressive quality of academia, as clearly to be educated is to be privileged. However. This should not be perceived as a recommendation or uh, for or a slight on MGTOW. I mean, far from it. It is not the mission of MGTOW to end feminism. I merely mean to say that MGTOW is actually helping in accomplishing this task by not interfering. Now, whatever happens to feminism is not as important as dealing with the postmodernist project as a whole. Now, the postmodernist project rests, at least from my understanding of it, on the Kantian proof that human beings have no access to the noumenal world. If Kant can be refuted, then that refutation would cut down postmodernism at the root. Now, people have been bickering in the philosophical world over Kant for centuries, and there is some debate over whether or not non-Euclidean geometry following Einstein is a sufficient refutation of Kant. However, there is no strong consensus against Kant at the moment. Now, there may be ways other than refuting Kant that would collapse postmodernism, but, but as of this time, I'm not familiar with any of those methods other than one. This method is, is something that immediately wipes the postmodernist position off the map, but would not work as a solution for some people. Religion refutes postmodernism. Now, let me explain. You see, postmodernism builds off Kant's proof that humans have no access to the noumenal world. Well... God has access to the noumenal world and can give humanity knowledge through revealed truth, namely through revelation. Revelation makes Kant irrelevant and gives an objective standard one can compare against any ideas developed by humans. But like I said, this solution will not appeal to everyone. Now, in the next and final video, we will cover feminist empiricism as the third and final feminist epistemological model. As for now, I hope you enjoyed this video. And thanks for listening. Go team.